everybody. Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Today on the show, we have Reggie Harris, founder, operator of Oakland Hyphy. Hyphy Labs, is that the new name? Yeah, well, there's there's two companies. We have Oakland Hyphy, which is more or less the uh, the events wing of what we do. And then we have Hyphy Labs that runs the um, telecybin mushroom potency testing. And like the, the science right side. That's fantastic. All right. And um, first question. What's a hyphae? So hyphae, um, when I was reading my, when I was going to YouTube University and when I was reading my, uh, my books on you know, how to grow, because a lot of people that, you know, grew psychedelic mushrooms, they, they, they came, they were underground. So they had to, before the internet, it was books. And after that, it, you know, it was clearly YouTube. But in reading that, um, I learned that half of um, the genetic code to make up a mushroom is located in in uh in something called a hyphae and when two hyphae meet it's a complete genetic code and then mushrooms can then grow so it, so like uh for instance you got half of what you need with the sperm you got half of what you need with an egg for a, a, a human body to be made and so um you know a hyphae is just half of the genetic information and if you if you're familiar with the bay if you're familiar with hip-hop we got the hyphae movement out here you know, me being a hip hop lover, I read that and I'm like, oh shit, this is hard. I gotta do this. And so, you know, if you're if you're a mycologist, you see that word and you're like, yeah, okay, I can relate. It's like a dog whistle. But also, if you're like a hip hop head or you're from the Bay, you see that and you're like, oh shit, I can relate. So that's all. Just that's a little super nice interesting. Words. Yeah, and <laughs> of course, I want to go down a mycological rabbit hole, but there's like. A, an incredible number of sexes of spores right <laughs> and like and this is you know we're talking spores not even like mushrooms like that's pre kind of mycelia and like the amount you just have to be something that's not you and it's like f massive number <laughs> and then like you can have myceliation and that's so cool like yeah, the whole thing is just fascinating it's it's interesting the whole breeding process and i don't want to call myself a, a, an expert at all uh, but I remember when I first started growing, I, I swore that I was hybridizing mushrooms, when in fact, most of the time I wasn't. Um, there are some individuals who are really, really good at uh, breeding mushrooms. And most of the time, the good people, you can only do it with with, uh, with microscopes uh, mm. if you want to if you want to be really good. I, I don't want to turn too deep into the uh, into the shameless plugs for the Oakland Psychedelic Conference yet. But we're going to have a spore isolation workshop done by one of the geniuses in the space william padilla brown that's fantastic news yeah this um what i've been observing in kind of like the mushroom grow space and like genetic space is so much uh alleged innovation and i i can't tell if it's real or not from as an outsider like for me it's gonna you know probably need like real deal genetic sequencing yeah and like you know contests like what you host these the psilocybin cup whatnot and like actually seeing potency numbers yeah um i can't tell you know even my subjective experience i think could be bullshit so like it's got to be some numbers there's um there's a lot there's guys much smarter than me who are right now working on using various scientific methods to be able to um to properly identify the various types of uh psilocybin mushrooms right now they aren't they, right now the genetic work is very basic um the the genetic work is much deeper clearly for obvious reasons on the non psilocybin or the non psychoactive side you know they, but the, they got these guys that are running around the woods with these mobile pcr uh this these pcr kits and i don't i can't tell you what pcr stands for but i do know that pcr is used to do a, a um uh genetic identification of mushrooms out in the wild so you again you have people like alan rockefeller you have people people like william padilla brown that are literally running around identifying these mushrooms down in oaxaca or wherever they are that nobody's ever seen before using these mobile pcr tests and i think to That's your so point, amazing to your point there is i i in this space this is, since it's been underground people have been able to say whatever the fuck they want to say you know oh this is a hybrid or this is this this is that they've been given they've been given things that already have a name, a whole different name so that they can kind of get proprietary information. But as sci as as the psychedelic space opens up a little bit more um, and as citizen scientists like myself, like Ian, um, 
my partner get into fucking around and finding out, we're able to kind of quantify and remove a lot of the nonsense um, and a lot of the anecdotes uh, and hearsay out of the psychedelic space in exchange for solid, quantifiable science that pushes the community and our understanding and, quite frankly, harm reduction and moves all that stuff forward. That's fascinating. Um, now I understand your sweatshirt. Fuck around and find out. Fuck around and um, find out. I love it. Write it down. And look <laughs> so, <laughs> so the um, backing up just a minute, PCR. So that that was an early LSD fueled creation invention where you actually kind of zoom in on a snippet of DNA and amplify it. Yeah. So you kind of like double it so you can actually tell what's what in a lab yeah. environment. So yeah, it probably used to take up a huge room and now they're doing it in like a handheld unit or Literally. something that's so sick. These guys yeah. are putting it on the in their check luggage and taking it overseas, man. There's, there's I think that they're gonna have a PCR kit, again, shameless plug, but I think they're gonna have a P PCR kit at the, at the conference and again, there's people in the world that do this, but the experts, Alan Rockefeller, William Padilla Brown, are two really solid folks that you want to get around to do this sort of work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, cool. So um, let's kind of talk about your your kind of interest in psychedelics. Like where where did you kind of kickstart, Reggie? Like what what was the first kind of inkling that this is an interesting topic for you? Um, yeah, I can talk about this. I'll try to my best to, to condense a long story, but, sure. um, like a lot of kids, my age with my background, rap music was extremely influential on the way that I lived my life. So, um, you know, at the time of my life, when I was curious, um, you know, Eminem had this song, uh, I forgot what the, I think it's the song's called my fault where he's talking about, I never meant to give you mushrooms, girl. Yeah. 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 Take you to my world. All that. Yeah. Yep. So he, he, he did yeah. that. That happened. Um, and it got me curious as to, OK, what, what, are, what are these mushrooms? Um, and so eventually I, I found I found a way to get the mushrooms. I took the mushrooms with my friends. Believe it or not, I couldn't come back then. I couldn't convince any of my black friends to take any of the mushrooms. But my white friends were all down for it. So we took the mushrooms. And uh, as we took the mushrooms, one of them said to me. How much for an eighth? And, uh, you know, being under the influence of mushrooms, it seemed ordinarily maybe that that statement wouldn't have wouldn't have been as profound as it was. But I think that one question shaped a large trajectory of the, the rest of my life, because at that point I had to think about, well, how much is an eight? And I quickly realized that the price that I was getting the things at was way lower than market value. So there was a bunch of entrepreneurship opportunity. Um, and so that's how I kind of got into it. I, I ended up in Europe working for one of the largest uh, mushroom cultivation uh, uh, farms in the world. Um, I, that took me down to Jamaica, cultivating down there. Um, you know, and, and clearly here, I lucked up on Oakland. I was here in 2019. I had spores and all that good stuff. And when the law changed, uh, you know, at that point, I think I was supporting my life with a little bit of cannabis and, and other stuff. And uh, the law changed and quickly I pivoted and just went directly in, um, you know, at, at first only wanted to cultivate, you know, that, that was it. I just want to cultivate. I want to be the best cultivator. I want to have the best medicine, but you know, being here in Oakland, being a community organizer, I kind of moved around in the space and kind of stumbled upon a very interesting niche where I would say at this point, we are helping to curate the culture uh, at least amongst the new school within the psychedelic space, you know, with events like the psilocybin cup where, you know, we take the guesswork out of potency and we make it fun. Uh, literally we've taken samples from all over the, the world to our, our events. You know, uh, the first event we ever had was in Denver, uh, two mother's days ago. And, you know, I'd never done an event before I, we, I was at, at one point helping a woman plan an event that same weekend. And when she told me she didn't have a budget for me, I just went ahead and did it myself. And I was like, fuck this. You know, I can I can do it better on my own and I'll, I'll raise at least something for my effort. And it was a hit. Uh, since then, we have a lot of love for Denver. But after that, we rolled into the first Oakland Psychedelic Conference. And that was a hit last last fall. And uh, from there on, it's, it's kind of history. So, um, you know, I don't I don't cultivate it all right now anymore. Um just because I don't have the time for it. But instead, I, I, I would say that we are we're curators of, of the psychedelic culture right now. That's fantastic. And at a really interesting um, and important physical nexus point, right? The Bay Area is so critical. Oakland being a leader out yeah. there and globally, really. <clears throat> so you've got to me. know a lot of this stuff. 
it irritates me that Colorado, that Denver went first. It irritates me that Denver decrimmed first, man. I wish, I so wish that Oakland would have did that shit first, man. That's the one thing I don't like. And it's nothing against Denver. I just wish that Oakland would have done it first. I, um, I've heard it said, I don't know if this is true or not, but the town I live in in Colorado was the first to decriminalize cannabis, um, if not in the state and nationally, which is yeah. pretty interesting. Um, can I say, can I, say I have the no town? idea if that's true. Can uh, Breckenridge. Yeah, I thought that was a town. So you, you think yeah. so? I, that's, you know, word on the street. I've never validated it. Yeah. It's been said to me so many times, but it's a, you know, super hippie town. So like, why wouldn't they? Um, I, remember, I remember back yeah, in the day. Just everybody I, that lives here is just ski bums that needed a, you know, a place that wasn't <laughs> normal culture. I like it out there, man. I, I like the general culture. Um, I remember taking trips out to uh, Denver, not Breckenridge. I've never been there, but Denver I went to early, early, early in the, the legal days. And it was, it, there was a lot of love there, man. You could still, there was a time when you, you, I remember I didn't have a license, but out there they were asking you to have like a, a medical card to go in. But I was from out of town and people just let me in and showed me. They were just so proud. It was just, it was good. That vibe doesn't really exist anymore. And, and I kind of understand you know, this was maybe 15 or so years ago where there, there was still... Oh, yeah. Regulators are heavy-handed right now. Yeah, you know, back, back then, most of the people who operated stores still were coming out of legacy sort of situations. And so if you came in and somebody would love, they'd show you love back. Now, I guess you can't afford to do it, but I just miss those days. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I didn't really start engaging with Colorado cannabis culture until like, you know, at any depth until... 2014 when it was going legal um but you know it was always around of course i just didn't like see the operators get to know anybody yeah but it was a really interesting thing and you know hearing a lot of those early complaints about you know for instance my girlfriend used to have to carry crazy amount of cash to go pay taxes from breckenridge to denver without an armed escort of any kind Honestly. Ev the same time every week so like that was a really simple thing that could have gone really bad for a lot of people and yeah. you know i'm surprised it didn't more often because it's just super predictable hit and runs yeah um, I, re I remember being here in oakland uh right kind of in the time right before it legalized so let's say 2015 2016 and uh we would we come down from the mountains with big uh with big diving bags or big hockey bags just packed to the brim full of harvest you know and we take it into stores and we sit in there with this big bag in the lobby and people would come and people would go and it would be on us to make it to our car safe and then to get where we needed to go safe it was it was it was not it was not sweet it was not sweet you want to talk about a fucking rush oh my god <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and i remember sitting in this government building once man and it was not just product it was like 30 people from different shops with all their money for the taxes for the month and I'm like, this is a dangerous ass room. There's only two armed guys outside. I'm like, this is, that's not adequate for this many millions of dollars that yeah. are in this room right now, guys. Like, yeah. holy hell. I don't know. Amazing that it went this well. But, you know, it's a scary situation the government put folks in. Absolutely. It's one of the reasons why now, I mean, they're still tripping. Uh, you know, the, we, you got, I think, 17 states have, uh, have legalized in some way, shape, or form. And uh, you still don't have any way that you could work. Uh, with with banking structures across the country, you know, it just it's ridiculous. They did literally they're doing it. You're doing every other aspect of business, including paying paying taxes, but you can't fucking put that money in a bank. Paying taxes twice. Yeah, yeah. Double and taxation on cannabis no, with no sure. write offs. Yeah, and so like I think you know it sucks, but this is just how it's going to play out. Whenever a state tries to go legal, we're going to see some really horrible, painful shit. Um, and I hope the people can correct the thing right like in time hopefully all of this improves but it's it's gonna take a lot of work everybody this is yeah. no joke this is like you know we got to get all our political prisoners out of jail still yeah. you know we're um yeah you know in cannabis we're st how many people are still in jail and like people are making a fucking killing so um, we're gonna see the same shit in psychedelics i mean i think you and i are our view, view the way we want to see this thing rolled out slightly differently um, I, I, from, from our, what I remember our last conversation was you wanted to, I want to buy a cheapest shit in Walmart, uh, with no prescription and anywhere, like, you know, a $3 bag, you know, like totally cool. If we see some, uh, craft operators, yeah. but like, I, I think like, 
needs to be cheap and accessible. Um, and cheap, cheap. I mean, like just about anybody can buy it. Um, all I, of it. So that's my end game, Reggie. Absolute ending of the drug war and total, like, you know, I'm, I'm talking all drugs, eat too. Like, I'm yeah. kind of an extremist on that front. Yeah. Um, well, but the more and more these days, I'm, I'm starting to roll that way. It's like, uh, you know, understanding what the government has done in terms of the way that they've leveraged these 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 quote drug laws against, you know, very targetedly against communities and then, you know, redefining the way that just just redefining even how you view a drug user. Um, you know, I think that I think that these laws, specifically drug laws, can be used as a weapon against a targeted weapon against communities. And so, I'd much rather see all the money go away from incarceration and more toward you know treat addiction treatment. Um, I like what they're doing up there in Canada with the Insight Centers, just making sure that like if we really if we really want to believe in the, in the sanctity of life, then you know let's make sure that people can live their best lives out here you know if somebody has if, if somebody has a problem we should deal with it the people are doing what they need to do responsibly and still maintaining all the things and leave them be you know it's not our place to be in a business if we end the dea and end a lot of that incarceration we have a lot of fucking resources freed up I, um I, I th- and state got, level I think, I think all we got to do is catch the right politician with drugs and, and the right pol- and, and then the right political parties will uh, start hollering in the dea i'm waiting on it <laughs> You know, I never thought I'd hear these people start saying defund the FBI. So I think there's hope. (laughs) (laughs) I'll start selling some defund the DEA t-shirts real soon. But like, here's a, here's a cool thing, Reggie is like, as we as individuals lose privacy rights to tech companies, so don't very wealthy, influential people like privacy is equally going away and people with lots of power similarly will also not have that kind of privacy. And as a result, we're going to have those opportunities a lot really yeah. soon yeah that's exactly that scenario you're talking about yeah you know i think i always think that the the the, the people that free us from the from the the rat race are going to be the it's going to be on the internet it's not going to be anything physical you're not going to see any shots but you're going to see some rebels decide that they want to fuck something up and they're going they're going to put something to the system that's going to reset everything i feel that have you got the chance to meet uh, Amanda Riemann yet? Not uh, yet. Professor UC Berkeley on cannabis. Do you know the name though? No, but I'd love to meet her. She seems like she's in my So area. cool. So cool. Um, she's got a, a really interesting uh, NFT project about um, supporting community growers. So oh. they'll actually oh, yeah, provide plants. Her. Yeah. It's called like a sacred garden, but it's not Bob Otis sacred garden. It's like its own thing. Yeah. Um, and <clears throat> It's cool as hell, man. It's like, how do we support local growers through technology and like kind of have a resilient kind of distribution platform where the farmers might ship direct and like the software might like distribute sales fairly. After, after we finish recording this, will you please put me in touch with her? The more you're talking, the yeah. more I want to fucking speak yeah. with her. <laughs> <laughs> yes, oh, you yeah. got it. Um, it. One of my favorite people I've met in the last couple of years, um, just like mind blowing. Um, so... Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think she lives like a little north of uh, the Bay, but like definitely um, had been teaching at UC Berkeley for a long time. Um, Yeah. And, you know, like I love these community efforts. Like, you know, you get a whole assorted pack of sacred plant seeds and teach you how to grow them. Like, fuck yeah. That's cool as hell. the, The reason I like stuff like this is because people always use terms like this is typically the way or, you know, this is traditionally how things are done, but they're only done that way until somebody has the, the goal to like rethink it, just rethink <laughs> it. And then, and There's then the reason it. a lot of us are raging against tradition, right? Yes. Yeah. You know, like somehow there's still Royal families out there. What the hell is that about? Yeah. Let, I don't even want to talk about that, man. I don't even want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> For another day. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> try to keep it inside uh yeah like we need to revolt against tradition to create the new thing that's required to save so many people's lives right i kind of feel like that's what you're doing i kind of feel like that's what i'm doing you know pushing into these these spaces that you know were were typically hush hush um and kind of bringing them to bringing bringing these conversations to the forefront, you know, pushing. I, I know I love to push the boundaries. When somebody invites me somewhere, man, I love nothing more than when I'm outside of Oakland. I remember we went to the California Academy of Sciences. They asked us to do a presentation over there, and that's in San Francisco. At the time, they were not decriminalized yet. And we just went over there with a bunch of bags full of live-growing mushrooms and just put them on the fucking table. 
but like they're they're that is <laughs> and and the whole that. team i went over there and i asked the team i'm like yo this is a big opportunity they might kick us out though are y'all cool let's do it and everybody was rolling because we like it we like to normal for for us it's like it's pushing against tradition but it's normalizing something else you know when I used to organize with one of the first organizing jobs I ever got was with the human rights campaign that pushed for, uh, you know, LGBTQ rights. And, you know, it, it, it one of the, the first things that one of the first parts of our push was if people are comfortable, if people are comfortable, you know, we didn't want people to, to out themselves at their detriment. But if people felt OK, we encouraged them to, like, tell their family, you know, what their situation was, because it because the more LGBTQ people that you realize or in your family, it normalizes it and it, it, it makes it less whatever the fuck it was before it was like before now. And I, I hope I'm not stumbling over words and I hope I'm not saying anything wrong, but basically no, you're nailing it. what we're doing, what, what we love to do here at, at Oakland Hyphae, and I, I don't even know if you realize that's what you're doing, but that's what you're doing. And we're normalizing these medicines that we believe in, you know, or these, you know, these things that we believe in, we're making it normal, we're making it accessible so that people look at you know, black people look at me and they're like, oh, shit, he's just like me. I can relate. You know, people look at you. Oh, shit. He's just like me. You know, he, he's he's not a he's not a, a, a burnout. He's he's maintaining his jobs. He's building. But he's still. So we normalize this shit. Yeah, it's super important. Um, and I think these conversations are essential, especially when we can have them with cultural figures where people are like, oh, he's just a musician. But it's like, whoa, musician yeah. that was healed by ayahuasca or whatever, and then has all these amazing stories to tell. And, you know, or, um, yeah, like yeah. how many of my family are locked up or something like Carl Hart yeah. is willing to like come out and say, which is really important. One of, the, one of the things that I think has been amazing, just talking about normalizing and bucking tradition, is when I think one of the best and one of the most influential messengers for psychedelics right now is Mike Tyson. I think it's Mike Tyson understanding where Mike Tyson came from. I'm talking about his, basically his whole life has been rough up until like as of recently. And we see this whole new Mike and everywhere he goes, he's talking about the impact that mushrooms have had or 5-MeO has had on his life. And, and, and you don't see a person. You know, this is macho is, is Mike Tyson, who has been through what Mike Tyson, who is as black as Mike. You know, you just don't see that package that has totally been reformed and polished and healed. And when you look at that and, and he, how he and evangelizes, you know, I, I guarantee that Mike Tyson alone is going to lead to one of the, the, the greatest waves of, of healing and in, 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 in amongst black people with psychedelics, probably that we that I've ever seen, you know, and that's no disrespect or not, not to not to not to. Not what Baba Kalindi's done, because Baba Kalindi is, is largely influential as well, but not so many people know about Baba Kalindi if you're not in the community, but everybody knows about Iron Mike. He's one of the greatest athletes to ever live. Right. And, um, yeah, so, like, when I... So, absolutely. Like, no doubt on any point you made there about Mike. I um, I get only critical on Mike on account of um, sustainability. Like, I'm really worried about the toad going away yeah um yeah and you know a celebrity just calling it the toad the toad the toad i find that a little tough but totally like i this is what's going to happen the culture is going to normalize it amazing people are going to come forward we just saw whatever nfl guy quarterback or whatever come out about it recently um how the fuck my friend named his fish after this guy I should be able to remember it aaron Rodgers. there it is oh, oh really <laughs> Aaron Rodgers came out about his psychedelic use somewhat recently. Yeah. Um, I think he's been to the quarterback. Green yeah. Day. Look at me try to talk sports. Uh, Super Bowl, is that what it's called? Yeah. I usually, like, on purpose, try to say it wrong. Um, so, like, trying to remember the actual like, World Super Cup, something. Because I, I don't give a shit, really. But, I, you know, ma I massive do, athletes, right? Crazy skills. I do that, I do that too, oftentimes, to disarm people. I, I, I play ignorant intentionally oftentimes sometimes i do it to, to joke around and sometimes i do it because i believe that people actually expect it and so you know i i, I live up to exactly what they expect <laughs> but we get more and more athletes talking about this more and more movie stars talking about this other personalities yeah yeah that's a big deal it's a really fucking big deal i can't think of a bigger celebrity like him and tyson like biggest yeah. celebrities i can think of 
so and and so so to kind of bring it back to what I was talking about in the beginning, this is the so I'm yeah I'm I'm in my late thirties right now and I've been I've been I've had a relationship with mushrooms since I've been fifteen or sixteen years old and I think that I've only come around I've only come across black people in large numbers that that partake in psychedelics like within the last three years. You know, because here in Oakland, it's been decriminalized. And so people, quote, come out the closet. And we can start to form communities and things. But, you know, but so now that it's decriminalized and we have these people like Will Smith and we have these people like Mike Tyson and Tiffany Haddish um, and Dave Chappelle that are coming out like singing. I didn't those. realize those two came out, too. Hell yeah. Yeah. So you, you, do you know Chef Nikki? Tiffany is one of my favorite comedians in the world. Um, you know Chef Nikki? She, she was in I know about us. Chef Nikki. Yeah, I got to meet her there, I think. Yeah. So Chef Nikki is Dave Chappelle's chef. And Chef Nikki curates uh, both cannabis-infused experiences, but also um, psilocybin-infused experiences. And, and, and t- Chef Nikki walked Nick, uh, uh, Tiffany Haddish through, through, uh, through her psilocybin experience. Oh, so wow. when you see her on, Let- I think it was Letterman or something, she was on some famous late-night show talking about her experience. That was Chef Nikki. Amazing. That's super cool and really, really great to know, right? Like how much influence there is there and people are going to talk, right? <laughs> like, you know, what's happening behind the curtain. Yep. They're just like, when is it right? Re- when am I ready to come out? Um, and I think athletes are doing this. Like I loved all the shit with the NBA with cannabis recently. I thought that was super important. And now it's like, we're probably going to see some, uh, yeah. Like pretty much saying like cannabis needs to be scrubbed from this shit. Like yeah. it's ridiculous. Like, been ridiculous for a long time. The, the, a lot um, of the way that they treat those fucking athletes in the NBA is ridiculous. You know, those are grown men and they treat them like kids. Some of them act crazy, but you know what? There, there are fucking guys from Wall Street that act crazy too that you just don't hear about. You know, so yeah, I think that exactly. I, I'm I'm glad to see I'm glad to see what I consider this colonial behavior uh, or this plantation fucking attitude coming off both the NFL and the NCAA. I'm glad that these college players can finally go get paid off their name and likeness because guess what most of them won't go pro <laughs> mm-hmm. and the, and the, yeah. and the and university big organizations make, made a killing yeah you know how's how's the coach make multi-millions and the kids are fucking old fr- franken beans <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. exactly so not fair and there's so much of this out there right it's endless so like how do we start growing up and i think psychedelics mushrooms particularly um on account of access super cheap and easy to grow on, at home Like these things are unregulatable. Like, yes, we're trying to do the black market thing with them, but it doesn't work. Like I, one of my favorite things, Reggie is looking at like mushroom prices for the last like 30, 40 years, barely any variability, which is fascinating. It's like tracking inflation and like going down at scale, like some specialty obviously are pricier. Do you mean edible mushrooms or do you mean the magic? Cubensis. Yes. Lost Cubensis for sure. Like I've been seeing like 25, $35 eighths consistently, at least since 2005. And I was asking some people previously, like that was their experience too, roughly speaking. So I think interesting. I think that I could be way way wrong too. Yeah. I've noticed a massive um, amount of variability within the last year and a half. So I've seen consistent numbers up until let, yeah, let's say the last year and a half. And after that, at least out here in California, we've seen a dramatic, a significant plummet uh, of the price. I'm talking about, uh, I would say, damn near 70% drop in price. And Did I tell you about this in Miami? Like I talked to a Canadian grower or a person that was in the know, and they were saying because of all the black market grows that flipped over to, from cannabis to um, cubensis mushrooms, um, like the price was absolutely totally collapsed, like 50 gallon garbage bags for a dollar kind of pricing, which is insane. I can see circumstances in which that that makes sense. The, the prices went really, really low. They're starting to recover a little bit now, but like, I, I mean, re- recover in terms of, all right, if we lost 70% of value, maybe we bounced back and gained a little, like 15% back, you know? Right. But, but right now, it's I'll, I'll be honest it's unless you're unless you're growing for personal consumption or you're at an extremely high scale cultivation isn't where it's at you know it's totally just, you it's, it's it's the competition is too much the supply is too high 
Um, and and yes, like your friend in Canada said, there's a lot of people, especially here in California, that they saw in 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 2019, 2018, the 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 bottom dropped out of weed, and right now everybody's starving in, in terms of weed, and so they're looking for, you know, these agricultural people. They're looking for the next thing to jump into that will produce them money that will s- sustain life. And so, you know, for every cannabis, for every 10 cannabis drop, people that drop out of cannabis, seven of them start growing mushrooms. It's kind of nice, but kind of tough. It's yeah. kind of nice. Like I to hate get, to see people lose kinda, money. It's kind of nice to get the, the market to where you want to see it. But yeah, for like people who have been, for people who are, who are doing this to kind of sustain life, you know, I'm seeing a lot of people on, in that aspect kind of suffer a little bit. What, um... So like you're in a community where you see like people having conversations about protecting legacy operators. Yeah, that's my um, And like, I'm kind of like really interested in what does that look like, right? Like, uh, you know, the decrim nature work is kind of like shaped towards that. I've ta- had a number of conversations with James McConkey from to Hate Street Shroom Shop Hate about Street, it. Yeah. And like, I kind of like understand a little bit, but like, how do we balance this with people like continuing the drug war other like you know non-psychedelic drug uh, war related harms and like i i have a really hard time trying to have a consistent worldview like i get single issue like looking at a single issue we can make some sense of that but when yeah. we get complex it's like my head just starts spinning and i don't know what to do um other than end the drug war immediately so um, i'm rolling i'm rolling there um and i want to preface what i'm going to say by saying i don't sure. have all the answers clearly but i think that I think that the number one thing that I know that we should do to protect legacy. And so hold on the reason that, so we don't just protect legacy operators to protect legacy operators. The reason that we want to protect legacy operators is because literally these are the people who have taken the risk. They've pushed back against social norms in order to get things to a point where, you know, we can even talk about decriminalizing or or legalizing. And so, you know, it's kind of a thank you legacy operator situation. I mean, like, Hey, we owe you. Yeah, kind of. It's like if we're going to if we're going to because the, what happens in, 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 in this space and, you know, way better than I do. But what happens in these 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 spaces when it goes legal, we have a choice. We have a choice to hand it over to corporations, which is which has been the tendency, hand it over to people who are highly capitalized. Let them come in and basically take things, take things over, drive the little guys out of business. And ultimately, the price goes down sometimes. Um, but, but most of the time, the little guys get run out of business. No thanks. All right. You're fucked. And this is a story that happens over and over and over. If you look at Northern California it's happening right now. So in order to, to add what we call reciprocity, because ultimately when you start talking legacies sooner or later, you're going to start talking about, you know, people who have been, uh, historically involved anyway, or people who have gotten a charge. So instead of doing this thing as a hindsight, what I'm advocating for is, to keep big money out as long as we can. How do we do that? Well, if I look at weed, when when it went legal, it allowed institutional money to come in and flood out everybody. So my only answer right now, as of now, is we need to go full, full decrim statewide, everywhere. You know, decrim and we can put we can implement community models to see what works, but I say decrim until we can figure out a way to roll it out in, in to roll out legalization in some way that doesn't just crush the normal people. You know, and maybe this is pie in the sky. It probably is pie in the sky. They've written a few pieces in Rolling Stone about about my position here, and they're they're basically saying that I'm like pushing against, you know, an incoming tide. But I would much rather I'd much rather try to hold the wall for a year or two or even five more years and give legacy operators a chance to get their business together, to get their you know paperwork together, to save up some money, to get their infrastructure together so that when the when the wall does come down, they've either built something that somebody can buy for a fair price or mm-hmm. they can actually compete. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I just I want to give people like myself a fair shot. Um at, at, at something that they've all helped build. You know, I see a lot of these, I deal with a lot of these corporate folks. I, I deal with a lot of these corporate folks that come in with money and they just want to buy their way in. They want to bastardize the culture and they just want to rape it for literally. And I, I use, I'm sorry if I triggered anybody, but they want to, they want to pimp this, this community for every single dollar that they can without putting a dollar back in, without knowing anybody, without having any relationships, without not, without having put in any work. And I just kind of feel like, 
let's try to do something different. You know, let's try to push back against that norm. And I think like, it's really sensible. And I like that. I like the intention. Like my, my biggest conflict is like, how do we balance this with drug policy, the drug war, incarceration, all this like stuff in general, all together. Like I, I like to take a bigger view, but I like totally understand what you're saying. Like we recently had, my town has 4,000 people in it. We had nine people in nine days from a contaminated drug supply. And like, that's unacceptable as shit. I know tons of people, well, like probably 10, 15 people in town who have been incarcerated for drug offenses. So like, this is, you know, how do we balance it? I don't, I don't have a good answer. I'm just saying like, this is where I get all tripped up and I'm like, uh, what do we do? Yeah. And like, if the intent is healing people, we should probably at the same time, stop harming people actively as well. Um, uh, unless we just want a more sustainable supply of patients to work on later. But like, you know, being snarky and shitty, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I, I just can't think through it and I get stuck. I'm waiting for the person to walk me through it, <laughs> but yeah, no, I haven't met that person yet. It's complicated. I, I don't have all the answers, but I yeah. do agree that we should stop. We should immediately stop putting people in, in jail for these things. You know, I think that we should stop putting people in jail. I, there's a, I have a bunch of things that I'd like to see change. I'd like to see civil forfeiture laws change, yeah. where, you know, where the, yeah. where, where the police aren't incentivized to rob you. I'd like to Did you see. catch this? The the civil forfeiture numbers were greater than theft in general. So the no. cops have been robbing people more than robbers have been robbing people didn't see via that, civil I, I forfeiture. Don't, don't that was maybe all. earlier this year that came out. Sorry, keep going. No, I, I don't doubt that. it at all. If you if you watch this this uh, HBO documentary called uh, "We uh, We Own the Night," it's about that those Baltimore City gun gun task force cops that was literally robbing drug dealers and they and they did this for years and years and years and, and and made money like tons of money but i believe that you know they should end the civil forfeiture i believe that they should end uh confidential informants if the police can't put the case together then the police can't put the case together i believe that they should end plea bargains you know if 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 you did it you know they shouldn't because what they do now is they scare you with the maximum instead of give you a fair sentence you know so that so that even if you didn't do it, they scare you with the idea of a trial. Nah, you need to prove it without a snitch. And then if it make the punishment fit the crime, you know, don't don't fucking hang somebody for a first offense just because they decided that they wanted to take it to trial. Exactly. Yeah. There's so much bullshit there. We need to clean up and we'll hopefully get there eventually. We just got to stay on it. Right. And not not eat ourselves. Like what I see in the psychedelic movement is everybody's does not give a shit how they treat somebody else as long as their point was made. And there's been some really bad behavior and I just hope we can kind of write this ship. So we're not, you know, corporations are all in line because people are getting paid by the higher ups. Right. And as a community, we all have our own kind of ideas, but like, how do we actually build community yeah. with, you know, being kind hearted, supportive of each other? Yeah. Um, you know, there's a lot there and there's, there's not too many organizations in the space acting properly. To, to move towards those ends, right? It's yeah. tough. It's it is. I don't it's, want to name anybody. I I I know. I guess you do, but you're not going to. <laughs> no, I never do. I never do, man. I never never. <laughs> um, but no, it's it, only it's, on internal meetings. It's that's it, it, funny. It's um, no, you're you're right, but I think yeah, you know, ultimately, I think the community will 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 rectify this. I do notice though that a lot of this infighting and a lot of this turmoil, uh only ultimately puts corporations who are you know in moving in sync to, to to give them the ability to move in take advantage and 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 get their 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 will done it is also very interesting for um for a lot of these actors that we're talking about uh in the space that might not be moving with as much love or compassion or understanding as one would would think um it's 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 interesting that we're in this space where the mushroom is supposed to melt away the ego and all these things. Uh, but we have these, these organizations that are all targeting and sniping. And I'll be honest, um, at one point I was, I, I would get wrapped up in it myself. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do better now, uh, because there's, there's absolutely so much love out here to, to focus on instead of focus on focusing on negativity, but it's just, it, it is interesting that, um, it's hard to find sometimes, but it is there. 
Like I've almost quit the scene so many times, Reggie. I feel you. Just like absolutely disgusted by behavior. I'm like, this you. is the worst. Yeah. <laughs> I'd rather go back to corporate America <laughs> and just be a widget for a while. I Calm wouldn't take fuck that down long. for a bit. <laughs> I almost did. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> Getting too excited here with my headphones. Um, but yeah, totally. I hear you. Um, and you know, it, it, I guess the call is be good to one another, please. Yeah. You're all like largely on the same team. Largely. We're, we're all largely on the same team. And I think the bigger message is that like, we like, you know, what's happening on the insides of these things. I know what's happening on the insides of these things, but there is this greater world that's not playing inside baseball. That's just looking at us as leaders and making judgments. And we need to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. We're very, we're being watched very carefully by the whole world because this is such an interesting movement um, for a lot of reasons. So switching gears, um, getting like really specific, Reggie, I would, and I have uh, all the anticipation in the world, you're going to have some fun shit to say about this, but um, Oregon, like, so just looking at Oregon as a Californian, but like watching, I'm sure you know plenty of what's going on there. Like, what are your, what are your like initial reactions on what's going on up there um, and how it's been playing out? When I, when I travel around and I don't know down to the letter of, of, of everything that's going on. But what I do know is Oregon is outright legalized. And I know the lights are coming on very, very, very soon. Um, there are, I, I watched a lot of the cultivation uh, decisions being made and crafted, and I watched who was making the decisions. Um, I, I, I think Oregon is going to be a cautionary tale that, that the rest of the country uses, again, as to why you don't want to legalize quickly. Um, you know, it's a med it's a medicalized model. And if you look at the players right now, um, anybody who has some backing is up there, you know, moving around in that space, trying, look, I mean, look at, look at what, why did they decide to hold horizons out there right now? I think only particularly as far as I can tell, because this is the biggest thing that's happened in American psychedelics in a long time. Right. But that's all I know. But also, um, but also, horizons and and from what I saw last year in New York, they it's it, they they they're not lacking in money, people. And and I think that like there's a, there's a lot of people in those circles with with financial targets that, that they they need to hit. And so I just you if you look at where they've moved the center of their commerce to, it is it is big, big, big shit. But I also think that it, it has something to do with the corporate type environment that's being developed and fostered there because they decide to legalize through a clinical sort of model. Yeah. And I'll add a little point of clarity. Like I think there was, and I see why you're saying it's clinical. Um, I think it was explicitly called a non-medical model and supported adult use. So the laws are so loose that you could have a music venue with mushrooms um, cool. if you had the, the right setup. So keep that in mind. So the laws are really interesting um, and and strange. We've been playing. We're uh, trying to think when this comes out. We're looking. Oh, yeah, I'll say this carefully. We're looking at education in Oregon. And, um, you know, because people will need a state level license. And we've been training for many years. So thought we were a good fit. So working with the state government, it's wild. And watching the laws and that whole process is wild. I am. Um, I'm uncomfortable by it, um, but it's because I'm invested in it. And, um, and largely, you know, I want to do business there, but the feds haven't put out any kind of memo. Remember how in cannabis, the feds put out some sort of memo, a coal memorandum or something. No, We're not going after state level legal activities. It's something to those, to that extent. Okay. We don't have that in incubensis and mushrooms. So like so the feds will get involved and will seize capital um and like assets so it's gonna be a weird time well i mean it's a it's 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 a weird time up there it's also weird get, because um uh, i know you know who dave hodges is don't you uh it sounds super familiar but i don't know offhand he, he's not in oregon but he's down here in oakland and he he opened up a church uh the mushroom church and they ran it they ran into his church two and a half years ago and took 200k and they took all his weed and took his mushrooms but no charges came down. And so he's decided Did he get cannabis charges and not mushroom charges or how did that, he didn't get no any charges whatsoever. He didn't get any charges. Wow. No one went to jail. And so what he's decided to do is to sue the city of Oakland, uh, over his, 
over his religious right to have the sacrament. Yeah. We need to be suing the government more, I think, just straight up. Um, so everybody should consider that when you see some unfair shit. Really carefully consider it. At a, at a, um, at a bare minimum, if you can't afford to sue them, fucking put, put paperwork in on, on police on police that haven't done right because that shit adds up and it does follow them around. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yep, I'm very close with somebody from physical police assault, and I really wish those cops uh, paid. Um, they didn't. I, uh... <laughs> Comically, I, maybe. It, and when I lived in New York, the police um, pulled me out of my car on a on an illegal search and seizure. I was driving a Mercedes, but I was working a political campaign, and uh, I was in the hood because that's where my staff was, you know, canvassing. And the police in Staten Island that's where they killed Eric Garner. And they jumped out, they opened my door without telling me to stop, put the gun in my face, and luckily, like I had the, the camera, I had the camera on them. They took me out, searched me took the SD card out of my phone, but there was a dude that they didn't see in a garage that witnessed it all. And uh, I didn't know that he witnessed it at first. And I went and put the complaint in and then my lawyer went and canvassed the area and she talked to him. He saw it. The police had to pay me $10,000 for that bullshit. Oof. It's not enough, but it, well, I'm glad not, that worked out. I'm glad it worked out too. Cause before I, before that it had happened many times before and I just thought nothing was going to happen. But now that's why I'm like, yo, you put that complaint in every single time. Yeah. Yeah. Brutal. Yeah. And like the fact that they can just steal an SD card, like that's ridiculous. And they, they, do, they, do were caught. The they, they thought yeah. they were smart, but they, there was this dude standing in the shadows and he saw it. Like I went, when I, cause I thought I was like, yes, I got him on camera. I started driving back to my office and my phone wasn't working. The next thing I know, the SD card was gone. Mm. Unreal. So, yeah, like back to Oregon, like I think totally it's going to be a messy time. It's going to be an ugly time. You know, the federal involvement, some, you know, publicly traded corporations. I find that fascinating. Um, but like, you know, it's. What, do you think what are the license? So there's licenses for testing, Reggie. I, I thought of you when I found out about all that stuff. Have you? Has anybody reached out to you on that front? A bunch of people have reached out to us on it. Um, I I'm on the let's wait and see. Like we have brand recognition, so I'm not terribly worried about that. And actually, now that I think about it, um, we have we actually just put a partnership together. I guess a month ago. Uh, with some guys out of with some guys out of uh, Colorado, and with both of our labs, we're we're shopping for consultation business out there. So we're shopping to set up people's labs for them, you know, turnkey labs, so that they don't have to worry about it. Because a a analytical testing is not easy. It's not just as easy as getting a scientist, and it's not just as easy as you know getting the proper machinery. You have to, you know, the the scientists and the machinery. They form a very close relationship. Um, and so it's just th things have to be calibrated exactly right. Um, you can't really move the equipment around. So long story less long, what, what the, the extent of what we're doing out there is getting labs ready to be functional. So we're not, we're not going in asking for any, any sort of licenses, but what we're doing is looking for uh, consultation, consultation gigs uh, to set people up to go. That's outstanding. Yeah, and it's imp important for those people who want to have those labs for sure. Um, I think one of the biggest weird limitations is that um, this is only for psilocybin through oral applications, and there's going to be huge portions of people who oral like swallowing something won't work. I'm thinking like particularly folks with throat cancer, um, people with stomach cancers, things like that. So there will be um, people with unmet needs. Um, based on the laws and not to mention the expense like we don't you know if this is done in a church community model i think we can deliver it for you know two to ten dollars each if it's done in a for-profit model it's gonna be like thousands probably yeah many thousands in a lot of cases but i think so yes to your point but also to another point i think this is where you know teaching people how to cultivate comes in because cultivation really is super easy so uh, my, my my buddy Seth Warner, who uh, who used to run uh, San Francisco, I had a great call with him the other day, man. He's great. So Seth has this fucking method where all you need is you know some some spores and a, a pack of Uncle Ben's rice, and you can grow your own mushrooms. Like it's that simple. So six bucks, you can grow 
you know, your own so that you can consume it however you want. And I understand what the regulations say, but I also think that, OK, if this is if this is all regulated, that also takes a level of risk out of the way for home cultivators. You know, you can you can do it yourself. That's a really good point. Like the judge is going to go a little easier, right? I mean, what judge is going to say you you cultivated a, a pack of Uncle mushrooms on Uncle Ben? You're going to no judge is going to put you in jail for that shit. <laughs> That's a silly case. That's interesting. I wonder what that would look like. Yeah, I, I wonder what it. No, I don't want to wonder what it would look like because it you know it would look ridiculous. <laughs> it's gonna happen. It's gonna happen at some point. But it's like, yeah, you're right. Like, I just did these two things. Now I'm a criminal. Do you um, know, and do you happen to know ahead. what's happening with Cole Milner? Um, you even know probation. We had him on uh, the podcast not that long ago to give his story. Yeah. Um, as far as I know, um, probation living out of Colorado. So he's back in Colorado now. Cool. cool, cool. Oh, sorry, no, he had to, he had to move back home. I think St. Louis maybe yeah. or something like I that. Was, and um, yeah, I'm, just I'm, probation, and it was really low. And he had a substantial, like not super substantial, but he had a sizable operation. Is, the reason that he's significant to me, and the reason I tell people about him is, I'm like, yo, he wasn't really doing shit. Like he really Except wasn't like at like, much of a scale at all. No, no, no. And so the I think people, they just wanted to make an example, right? Yes, they wanted to make an example. Uh, that's what I think. But like, you have these people out here thinking shit is sweet in places where it's not even decriminalized, you know. And they're they're making what Cole Milner looked like, like nothing, like a drop in a fucking bucket. And so I just to your point, about, the feds can come in at any moment, right? Yeah, to your point, to your point about the feds, like it is not sweet out here. At all. So the, it's going to be hard for a number of people. It's going to be interesting to see how this how this happens in, in Oregon on that front. But I hope that if the, if the cops do start enforcing on people, that they don't come taking the lowest hanging fruit. You know, poor folks or people who they know can't defend themselves. Like, go after the people who are really out here fucking violating, you know, if you're going to if you're going to do something. Right. Like serious scale cultivation kind of stuff totally like or or yeah in the coal situation just for people who don't know it was in the city of denver city city county of denver it was post decriminalization i believe yeah like a week or two after um and yeah federal charges there was multiple federal agencies i think came in or at least the dea and i chatted with another gentleman from uh, dc somewhat recently and he alleged that there was four he got popped for not even an actual violation. He got like multiple agencies raided his house because it's DC feds all. Shit. And then um, he said that there was maybe 14 cases. This was pre decrim, okay. like a couple days before decrim. And he didn't even, he wasn't even in possession of anything that was scheduled. Um, so like, that was fucking wild. So um, there was maybe 14 cases around the time when certain municipalities were kind of just popping off like that where the feds came in and made a case made a scene um i want to really document those so if anybody has evidence like please send it over to us um, i would love to see it um because it would show that there's like an organized uh response from the dea and other agencies to spook us more like we're already scared plenty feds <laughs> like I mean, you know. if I'm being honest, that's the reason I stopped growing. I was like, if I'm going to start, if I'm going to be out here and I'm going to start doing, you know, these events and I'm going to move around in this space the way that I, that I am, you know, I, I'm not even going to risk it at all. Not worth it to me, you know. And so I just I decided to go heavy into, you know, again, this cultural curation is, is what I'm is what I like to categorize it as. Yeah. And um yeah, ancillary businesses are super necessary out here. So I'm glad you're doing this stuff. And, you know, how did you expect when you were launching Psilocybin Cup for it to be that popular? I was terrified when I when I launched the first thing because I'm not a scientist. So I was putting like I had to put all of my all of my reputation into somebody else's hands. And this person could have for real because all right, so who's this who's this black man who you know, claims to be legacy, who now claims that he can test mushrooms. And then all, there's all these nerds out here that are, you know, just fiending to prove me wrong. And nobody has so far. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, we had when we did the first Hallisiben Cup, we had some really big dogs in there. So there's a guy named Michael Tech, who was like one of the first mushroom people to ever end up in high times. 
you know, huge player in the in the community. And, and he entered in. My man, Willie Michael, who basically taught anybody who knows how to grow off YouTube, taught him something. You know, he 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 entered in. And when we got the results back, neither of their, those, their results were near the top. And so right then and there, I'm like, oh, shit, these guys who have massive amounts of influence aren't where I thought they were going to be. I forced the, the scientist to I forced the scientist to, to run the test again. They ran it again, came out. The results came out the same. And so, you know, I was just nervous putting them out. But when we put those results out, man, the world went crazy. It was like the feeling afterwards was great. But yeah, I was ter- But I'm terrified after I'm terrified before I do anything big. You know, so before I saw you in Denver, I was terrified to, to, to do that event. It's a big event, man. Yeah. Um, I think that was, yeah, I think that was the easy, easiest, the biggest psychedelic event I've seen in Colorado. Um, I think, or especially a conference style thing. Um, yeah. And I, no, I get it, man. Like there's so much, um, that goes on. Like anything big is super scary, you know? And I get it. Like everybody's out there wanting to prove each other wrong, you know? And there's, and, uh, and, and, and then when you put, when, and I know you'll experience, you have probably experienced this. When you put yourself in the public eye, you put yourself at the whim of all their opinions. And so, like, is this going to hit? Are people going to like this? You know, is this, you know, it's just, it's very scary. But it's rewarding when it does hit. You know, it's rewarding when people come up to you and say shit like what you just said about, you know, that's one of the biggest. Nobody's ever said that to me, but that stuff feels good. Yeah, like, it's a, it was a big deal. Um, and, like, the... <laughs> how wide are most psychedelic conferences? Like the diversity you brought to that fucking Denver conference was incredible. Like that, that alone, I think the diversity alone of getting those people in the same room, amazing work. So like, here's, here's one for you. Here's one for you at the upcoming conference. We have both, uh, Carlos Pozzola is going to be there speaking and David Brown is going to be there speaking. Uh, same day, not same panel, but same day, where el- where else in the world are you going to see these two individuals who are both massively influential in the psychedelic space, specifically around policy, you know, gathering in the same spaces? Mm. That's a really good point. I think nowhere. <laughs> nowhere. Um, yeah. And that's, um, you know, I think you're doing really important work there. Um, I try to do it digitally when possible. Um, but, you know, it's it's a hard, it's a hard ball of wax to you know get into like that's it's my goal it's my goal to not get involved in people's personal shit but always be in pursuit of the most clear uh concise information that people can use to then make good decisions about how they want to move throughout this space that's the goal and so i stay friends with both of them you know i text i text david just like i text carlos um, you know, I don't get involved in, in any of the, 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 you know, the whatever between whomever, but I, I, I try my best. Sometimes I can't help but to get pulled into stuff. I try to avoid it, but where all it. possible, I want to maintain relationships hmm. because, because for the good of the people, quite frankly. Right. And, you know, if you look at what you just said about trying to make it easily digestible, all this stuff, it goes back to what we were saying earlier about, um, mushroom sellers just saying whatever they wanted as part of their sales pitch and now we know like probably 80 percent of that was you know bullshit yeah. and you know quite similarly here like I, the drug war caused that problem and you know culture caused this other problem and we it's very similar problems it's you know how do we expose this shit to some light so that we can understand it um, and make some progress once we understand these things a little better you know have better debate Right. That's that's the goal. Have 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 clear uh, quality, and I don't even want to say. Uh, let's say discourse. You know, have clear quality discourse amongst um, stakeholders. You know, I think that a lot of there's a lot of missed opportunity when a lot of stakeholders communicate because there's a lot of shit in there that's irrelevant to what people want to hear. And yes, everybody wants to see a food fight, but really. You know, people people didn't come to these various spaces for the food fight. People came to these various spaces for the plant medicine and to figure out how they can, you know, to to get and to expand access to the plant. Yeah, like 
let's bring it down to some like really core issues. Like oh, my sister's going to die from anorexia. Mushrooms might be able to help. You know, my friend committed suicide because of OCD. Mushrooms could have helped. Like my mother's dying from cancer. Maybe existential anxiety could have been sorted out here. It's like there's so many really amazingly powerful stories that we could pull on. Those are all made up, by the way. Um, but like, you know, these are really big things like that people are coming to this space for. They don't give a fuck about the drama. The drama just looks like children, like having a fit on the playground, right? Really, we're here to like help some help people at scale, help lots of people. That's it. Um, mushrooms scale, LSD scales, MDMA scales, like a lot of things don't, unfortunately. Um, so if if we're looking at mass healing, like we've got a long way to go, but like, you know, we got to start thinking clearly about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm glad, I'm glad you're on the same page there, Reggie. It's good to, good to know that it's like a core part of your project. Um, so plot your efforts. I, I pride myself in, in tr not trying to be the smartest person in the room. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a hard act to keep up, but I, you know, I, if you want to be honest, what, the way that I shape my conferences are, hmm, what don't I know? Or what do I want to know more about? And so it's like a big, it, it's like a space to answer all the questions that I have in my head that I just invite everybody else to come attend as well. Mm, that's brilliant. That's how I did treat the podcast for the longest time. It's like, you know, now those, those discussions are boring. I want to talk about these other things. Yeah. Like, uh, like how many times can I hear that story that I've been hearing for a decade and a half? Like, no, we're going to do this other one. Um, so like, that's why we have had very few, like super duper famous people on the show. Like I try to keep it more Who? like organizers like yourself. Who's the most famous um, person you ahead. ever had on the show? That's a really good question. Um, Carl Hart, maybe I'd have to look man. Like, cause that's not even my, like, <laughs> I like actively try not to, um, that's going to shift for sure. But, um, <laughs> cause there's going to be like, like, I actually kind of want to spin up like a celebrity focused show pretty soon. Like just to get those stories out there. Like yeah. we're talking yeah, like athletes coming out and doing that. Um, Steve D'Angelo, he might be more famous. Yeah. Yeah. Um, than Carl Hart. I, th I think I'm just scrolling. I think depending upon the, the circles, like if, the, if they're weed circles without a shadow of a doubt, Steve D'Angelo is like God status. I think that more recently, especially around like some, some harm reduction type circles, it might be Dr. Carl Hart. But like, yeah, I definitely, I've definitely known of who Steve D'Angelo was for for a decade longer than I've known who Dr. Carl Hart was, decade plus. Yeah, I knew about Carl Hart first. Really? Uh, if that if that gives me any cred. Wow, that's. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is interesting. This is interesting. Cause I don't know cannabis as well. Like I wasn't really personally in the biz as peripheral to it. Oh yeah. Okay. Like who, like, of course I saw his photo. Like who's that guy with the braids? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, um, no, like I was he's done a really good job of personal branding. I was trying, he does, he has done that. Um, I was trying to have a conversation. I was trying to include him in, in one of my panels here. Cause he asked to come to my last Oakland conference, but I'm having a panel here with like, um a lot of the the cannabis pioneers will talk about lessons learned and so we have people like um ed rosenthal from the cannabis industry uh the dude who made gelato his name is uh, mario guzman he'll be there um i reached out to the dude who made the emerald cup tim blake will be there man and i was in oh, conversations cool. with all of them talking and uh i, I wanted to get steven d'angelo on that panel because if you talk to all of those players that that really literally shaped, you know, cannabis for the last 50 years and you, they, they like have political stories, just like the people in the plant medicine world have political stories. It's very interesting. And so all of them play different roles and advocating for different things. And I'm like, Hmm, this would be a hell of a conversation. That's one of my goals. I got everybody on stage, but Steve D'Angelo, but I'm aiming, I'm trying to get Steve D'Angelo one of these days. Uh, we're, slowly becoming buddies with him so maybe we can do something together there that'd be fun yeah um it's a you know there's a lot of lessons learned from legacy cannabis operators like that and you know i think his primary claim to fame what is selling the first state legal cannabis um in california yeah, yeah. and i mean it's interesting 
truth be told, Harborside set the standard for for a very, very, very long time. Like they had some of the best pe- growers coming through there. They had some of the that's where you wanted to have your shit placed. So yeah, in order, in, in addition to having the first, their shit was also pretty pretty quality. Um, but also like Steve D'Angelo, he he's from D.C. I moved out. I, I lived in D.C. for a long period of time. And I, I wanted to be in the cannabis industry. So I watched this dude from D.C. come out here to California, you know, get involved in sort of activism and and really like set the flag and evolve with the industry as it grew. You know, and now he, he came from, I guess, a legacy sort of background to now being one of the more notable players while you're looking around and seeing a lot of people star. But to that point, there's a lot of other legacy players that look around and take issue with you know i guess how he got where he got and so i just it'd be an interesting conversation to have especially having the insight from so many other people in the the space totally and like instead of thinking like oh how how can we shame people more and better like let's go how can we actually learn from their decisions and you know perceived mistakes if that's what we're looking at right and that's it Um, i think that's a more intelligent use of the time that's it well and so again that's that that would be my my ultimate goal to because you cannot say that he was not one of the most influential, one one of the most instrumental players. Um, there was there was a, a acreage ban that uh, that got passed with with one of these with uh, with with one of these bills that legalized cannabis. And there was a, there was an acreage ban that was supposed to ban uh, large farms for like five years. And you know something ended up happening, and Gavin Newsom came out before the five years was up and lifted the ban by executive order. And uh, a lot of people say that that particular thing was was the straw that broke the camel's back uh, and expedited the the mass downfall of the cannabis industry in California as we knew it. Do you have anything you like to say about how? Um... <sighs> like taxation and regulation have impacted um, and been a boon to, you know, legacy black market operators, maybe in cannabis and how that might look in psychedelics. Like, so say Oregon mushrooms are going to be, you know, what, maybe $200 for three grams or something on account of regulation, testing, et cetera. You know, and I'm, I'm just making up numbers, right? Like I have no yeah. idea, but like, go ahead. But we can, I mean, we can look at, we can look at, cannabis in the stores right now and even though cannabis on the street is at an all-time low you know it's so it's so low i think i just bought i never just had pounds of personal personal weed but i just bought you know a pound to smoke because it's just economically the smart thing to do um so you see prices on the street at an all-time low but you still see the people who try to operate within the legalized framework being crushed by being taxed through the nose you know you you, you can't write anything off you get taxed through the nose. You got to pay. You know, you can't really bank. You got to pay extra expense because because of the nature of your business. And, and a lot of people make it hard to stand up. I it's funny as I as I watch the cannabis industry um, in 2018 when they re, when they legalized, everybody wanted to play by the rules. Everybody wanted to comply, and so they cut a lot of the the brokers off that they dealt with. A lot of relationships were altered because people wanted to go legal. But then when they tried to play around in the legal space for a year, year and a half, and they realized that they were being taxed into oblivion, people opened that back door right on up. And so I say that to 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 Oregon. One of the good things about having uh, a market that's rolled out wrong where, you know, it's it's where they didn't learn any lessons from cannabis and they're they're starting to tax the hell. There's no reason that under a legal framework, you're selling a two hundred dollar ounce of mushrooms. There's absolutely no reason for that. You know, under a legal framework, that that ounce should probably be anywhere between seventy five and to a hundred bucks. You know, that's a fair price for it. Um, and I know you're just pulling numbers out, but that probably is close to the way it would look, maybe more. Um, and so what that does right. is give life back to legacy people that otherwise would have been squeezed out. I think that I I, I do think that if if they want to play the tax game, like we 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 we'd sold the tax game to minute to minute. Two, mini- two municipalities as a as a carrot to make them want to go ahead and pass it. I think that there's ways that we can do it, uh, but I just don't think that I think I think that taxes need to be low. If anything, I think that if 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 we're going to levy taxes on anybody, it should be 
these plant medicine businesses or these psychedelic businesses that make above X, Y, and Z. So if you're if you're grossing, you know, over a million, then you have to pay a fucking a tax and let everybody else fucking have their small business. Or maybe the the tax is so reduced that it's just like a all right, you're paying a tithe and you keep it moving. But I just I don't think that the model that is currently set yeah, up like how do we keep it like normal business, right? Like how do we make taxes on a mushroom business look like it would look at a so an auto body or some shit, right? Like not let's not do vice tax like we're doing. So the psilocybin alcohol, mushroom, cannabis, etc. So uh, so decriminalize decriminalize California, which is different than decriminalized nature, but decriminalized California ran. I, I disagreed with large pieces of that legislation, and I definitely disagree with the leadership. But um, but what they did do that seemed like it did kind of make sense, at least for the little people. Like, I think that there's there's tweaking that you should do with the language to, again, keep big money out. But I think that if you made the licensing cheap or free, like very cheap or very free to like individual operators or people who are going to be operating at home or even people who are going to be operating at small scale, if you made it very accessible to them, made the tax just like you would do, you know, a regular food tax, uh, for at least at least the small business operators and then when you start to make money and maybe you get up to above you know seven seven hundred and fifty thousand or up above a million then all right now you can start you, you you know you pay a little luxury tax because that makes sense you're paying your fair share you're making money you, you pay it back but you know you got to give people a chance to get their feet up underneath them first right um yeah, and I haven't yet heard anything in Oregon specifically around how do we um, give a little bit of retribution to people who have been incarcerated for drug offenses here. Like, how do we get people out of jail for something like a mushroom sale or cannabis sale and maybe even give them money to help start their mushroom business in Oregon, right? I mean, like, yeah. that that is a big deal. It's radical, but but if we if we move slow, we can write shit like that in. Oregon came in and fucking swept through, and they got the rules together real quick with a whole bunch of people from the weed community. Like half the people that put those fucking Oregon rules together weren't even they had nothing to do with mushrooms. Um, and so I agree with all that. I think that part of any legalization, part of any legalization, means that you let those people out that got like it's fucking insane. It's fucking insane. And then they'll say, oh, well, they got locked up for the drugs and the gun. I, man, listen, I think that I think it's a wash. <laughs> I think we charge the whole thing to the game. You keep the gun. You let the people out. Time served. You know, but it, but let these motherfuckers yeah. out. Because we all we all agree that it's ridiculous. We all agree that they're not rehabilitating anybody. It's, it's, a, it's a drain. You know, uh, uh, conservatives can we I, it's, it's crazy that the conservatives can want to be want to talk fiscally responsible but like they support locking people up like this it costs so much to keep these people locked up it's not a good use of of, of community money wholeheartedly agree yeah it's in fact um damaging families for multiple generations and so much more like the yeah the consequences of this have been disastrous so we've got to figure out a way forward and it's not just ending the drug war, right? It's like that and um, figuring out a way to make it right. Yeah. Because we're we're absolutely on the wrong side of history as a country here, um, you know, and it's kind of a global civilization. It's not awesome um, how we're treating folks here. So I think as of figure lately, that shit out. I think as of lately, the only people that we give uh, uh, that that we we give money to. To, to right wrongs that we've done are corporations. Like the only people that we're out here just giving money to is corporations. We as a country have, we, we, we are very, 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 very to, to corporations and wars, but we as a country are very, very, very hesitant to like uh, repair harm to people who we view as, you know, the, I guess not the people, not the, not the choice people in this, in this country is what I'll say. I think you're right. Yeah, and we need to be doing better with like this this kind of idea, public private partnerships, nonprofits, like how do we actually serve a population really well? And it's not necessarily by saying I have a solution for you, it's by going and asking them what are their biggest problems and what can we help with. And like we're not doing that kind of basic work as opposed, you know, that's 
I guess the establishment's been doing that forever, right? So we have the solution for you. You don't have a say in it. <laughs> yeah. So we'll we'll get there eventually, I hope. Um, but you know, really, we just got to stay on it, man, and stay vigilant, and um, you know, try our best to steward this shit well. Like I, I have, um, I've done all of my uh, fellow constituents in Colorado a grave disservice by barely paying attention to what's going on. And I know it's a high drama scenario. Oh yeah. And I need to probably start getting involved like really soon. Oh yeah, man. It's a lot going on in Colorado right now. It's looking like um, it's looking like the 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 bill that New Approach Pack um, got on the ballot. It's looking like it's probably going to pass, uh, which would be. Yeah, remember I, it was like seventy percent pass, maybe. Set so, like I think was the polling number a while ago. If they got it on the ballot, <clears throat> the likelihood was that it was going to pass, and then it got on the ballot. What I see happening now, what I see happening is grassroots folks being like, "Nah, we don't fuck with it." And but the problem is that the one, the problem, the problem is that I think the grassroots in this instance is going to get rolled over, just because again organized money is too powerful right now and like and, mm -hmm. and and i'm not saying either i have to say the people i know who are on the dn side in colorado like it, everything i see from them is super distasteful and i'm just like ugh. and it's, i think they're shooting themselves in the foot it's like they what? could make better distasteful okay. like angry hateful kind of like a lot of jabby name collie kind of stuff they could be more effective if they structured their shit a little better but I get it. They don't have the resources that New Approach has um, and other organizations have. So there's, there's definitely a resource situation too. You know, so I think that I don't, I don't know what the hell I would do if I was in that situation because I'm not in that situation and I don't know, um, you know, I don't have all the facts. But I do know that it's looking like there's not much that can be done to stop what's about to happen in terms of statewide decriminalization and uh in Colorado, the way that, um, in terms of the way that new approach rolls out. Yeah. So that, yeah. I mean, that's, um... that, that means that there's really uh, in Colorado, it, it would, it's really, really big. That would mean Colorado would be the first, uh, the first state to go statewide decrim because the, uh, Oregon is, yeah, I want both to pass. If I'm being honest, like I, I well, want is a strong word. I think, there's room for both the decrim bill and the legalization bill to pass together. Like, and you know, like neither of these really hit the mark for me because I'm talking like, you know, everything being wide open for everybody, no, no registration required, buy whatever you want at whatever store or at the internet or whatever. So like, to me, this is a good baby step, all of it, but it's, you know, perfect. Neither for sure is perfect. Um, I'm, yeah, filled I'm, with problems everywhere. I've, I, as I've started to move around in this policy space in in the uh, in the plant medicine world or the world of entheogens, I have come to the realization that I take extreme positions, understanding that understanding exactly what incremental understanding and accepting incrementalism. So I take extreme positions to make the increment a little bit bigger than it would yeah. be if I took a moderate position. I think that's fair. Yeah, right? Like, we've got to have people out there showing what the future vision might look like, a really healthy future vision for everything from decrim to legal to whatever it is. Because, you know, we don't want decrim forever, I don't think. No. Um, you know, because there's still shadows, right? Like, I, the Francoise Borzat thing happened because of the drug war. If the drug war wasn't there, that whole thing wouldn't have happened in the bay and well, 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 um hold on i'm i'm unfamiliar i think i may have missed that piece of history the Please school of consciousness medicine are you familiar with that um mm -hmm. situation oh, that played oh, out in oh, san francisco no, a little I, while ago i i heard about it so i you know my I, my man Aize told me about this i know exactly uh i know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about he and i have had a number of conversations about it i think um <laughs> yeah um so like because there was secrecy and scarcity and hierarchy, all that shit just developed in the shadows. Yeah. Um, and like, if the shadows weren't there, 
conversation could have been had. Abuses could have been called out a lot earlier saying, Oh look, like, yeah, maybe my mom was right that I was in a cult. Like shit. <laughs> Wish yeah. I knew this earlier. Would have saved 20 G's at least in a couple of years. Like, but you know, I'm not saying there wasn't value there. I'm just saying like, there was a lot of really nasty stuff going on. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it the drug war is for me, the linchpin and, and why that happened. Um, and you know, there's plenty of other situations happening very similarly to that all over the world. Yeah. And it's because of secrecy drug war, you know, we have to have operational security, but operational security breeds kind of like some really weird stuff, weird behavior. Yeah. 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 I'm sure you see it when you talk to like different folks in regards to the cup, you're just like, yo, whatever, whatever pseudonym you want, man, <laughs> like, I don't care. So, but like you can imagine what's happening behind the scenes. So we, to, to, to your point, yes, uh, we have, we have both operational and uh, operational security to keep us safe, which means that just any old person can't enter into the cup. Like you have to have worked with somebody in the community and have good standing or that person just has to be willing to accept the things for you and they can get the things where they need to go. But just, we don't just deal with anybody because anybody could be anybody. Uh, but then also on the other end, yes, there's an intake form and we tell people, you know, we don't care what you put on there. We're going to report it as is. And that can create problems sometimes when we're talking about phenotypes, but it's not my job uh, to identify the proper phenotype. It's my job to identify the proper potency. So whatever they put, we take a picture of it, we document it, we report it out, and uh, and you know whatever they put is what we report for safety reasons. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And like, I really, I would love in the future, like whenever whenever laws or resources allow for like you know genetic. <laughs> like a quick PCR or something to see you have like, you know, it's this one or it's that one, you know, like that would be super cool. But like, I think we're probably a few years out from that kind of like availability of that tech. Right. Well, I think that that tech exists for regular, regular mushrooms, but I don't think that that tech exists to, to tell the, the genetic variation between, um, uh, Cubenti mushrooms. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the way that I understand the scientists explaining it to me was that, you know, you can tell the, the the difference between species, but within a species, you can't you can't tell the variation genetically using PCR. But I could be wrong. I suppose. Yeah, we'd need to look into that. That's um, that's a cool problem to investigate, right? Like, I would hope somebody's got an interest in doing this in Jamaica, where you can do it like above board or something. Like, uh, a lot of people have interest in doing it. Hmm. Cause having that genetic library would be so amazing yeah. for us to like not be talking shit. Right. Like we actually have solid things to chat about and like now we can have a substantial conversation as opposed to like wildly speculative about yeah. some bullshit on Reddit or it's, YouTube. Right. It's coming. I believe it's coming. Um, even mm, if you look at, great. If, if you look at, if you look at the pace in which genetics have just leaped up in the United States, is I believe the United States dominates mushroom genetics by far. Uh, but if you look at how far they've come in such a short period of time, I can only I can only assume that the science, um, that the the, you know, the analytical chemistry is going to be right there, be right there behind it, especially as more and more places decriminalize. I think that makes sense. The more I learn about black market players right now who are developing brands, I, I see that there is this desire and they have resources. Um, so like, I think we're going to see some really cool shit in the next year. Yeah. Um, if I had to guess regarding, you know, genetic IDs and all that. Um, but yeah, I think you're spot on, man. Like U S for sure. Like is, is killing it globally on the mushroom front. I, um, I used to think that Dutch genetics were the best and I would look at the average Dutch genetics that you get and they'd flush, but they wouldn't flush nearly as abundantly and prolific, prolifically as some of today's U S uh, genetic variations do. I mean, these guys, it's like fucking mushrooms on steroids these days. Not in terms of the potency, but that too. But uh, what I'm talking about in terms of the way that they come out, man, they fruit prolifically these days. Like the average yeah, I've been seeing a lot more big mushrooms um, yeah. for sure. Um, yeah, and you know, it's cool to see the market differentiate because not everybody wants the super huge individual mushrooms, but they're like beautiful 
like people are actually like cleaning them up and like hand trim yeah i was like that's yeah that's super you know, neat to like see the progression of the market and the products available when i when i remember way back in the day having dirt on the bottom of it was just fine you know now it's like nah, i'm yeah. gonna harvest it at the perfect time and if you know if you know how mushrooms grow man that to harvest them with the closed cap requires a very large amount of dedication yeah like yeah, it, you might be up at two, two, three in the morning you trimming. Time it just right because as soon as that veil pops, the fucking uh, the spores drop. Well, let's try. Let's talk about that real quick. So, like, are when the when the veil breaks, the spores start doing their thing. Um, is there a substantial difference in that product, like in terms of sil- available psilocybin content? From my understanding, spores don't necessarily contain psilocybin, but. Like it's obviously a really pretty thing when you get a mushroom that the veil isn't popped on. So um, there's there are theories. No, okay. spor- spores don't spores don't contain psilocybin, but they might. But the mushrooms might use psilocybin to produce the spores. Um, oh. So we haven't we haven't tested you know uh, varieties within the same batch, open caps versus closed caps, and we could run that. And we probably should, but what we have done is to run tests significantly against mushrooms that consistently uh, drop spores and mushrooms that don't. So, for instance, um, you know, the Enigma, which is a brain coral, or, you know, these albino penis envies, or to a certain extent, penis envies, um, you know, a lot of these mushrooms just don't drop spores. And the anecdotes uh, and and the the testing... uh, the testing trend shows that mushrooms that don't produce spores typically are more potent than the mushrooms that do produce spores. Wow. So like the, muta- okay. the mutations generally are the ones that typically test higher, not all the time, but typically more often than not. So man, that's a whole rabbit hole. I want to go down with you, but we don't have time. You know, so there's a, there's a- <laughs> I love this genetics topic, man. Um, and like when I, when I think of, oh, you're not dropping spores. I'm like, oh, you got so like inbred that you can't like do your biological niche anymore. But with a human relationship, you can. And like, there's some really cool, interesting things that could come as a result. I'll send um, you, um, I'll, so we're going to videotape our, our panel conversations and I'll send you, uh, we, we have them available by way of our Substack channel and I'll send you a free subscription to our Substack so you can see we're actually going to awesome. have, um, uh, we're actually going to have a panel conversation that, that is talking about, uh, mushroom genetics, past, present and possible future. And there's, there's a bunch of mushroom scientists talking about, yeah, just this sort of thing. That's fantastic. And thanks for bringing it to light. Like it's super important. Um, yeah. Well, Reggie, anything else we didn't hit? Um, I think we've kind of hit the time. I think that, yeah, I think that's it. I, um, after this, I'm going to hop on a call with some guys. I'm hoping to partner with some folks to make the, the, well, I, I used to call it the psilocybin cup. Now I'll call it the hyphae cup because I want to uh, brand it just a little deeper. Uh, but I'm, I'm hoping to, to partner with some folks to really take that event to the next level, meaning, you know, a higher level of competition, uh, a higher level of people who see you and can and you can get credit for when you win, uh, and also um, a, a really huge uh, in-person aspect. So I'm hoping, pray for me. I'm hoping that that I, that I can form that partnership and make that happen. That sounds great. Yeah, my brain. As I'm hearing you, I'm like running wild with ideas. But I think let's wrap. <laughs> so what are what are your websites, Reggie? So uh, you can find any information about Oakland Hyphae, and that's spelled O-A-K, uh, L- Oakland, O-A-K-L-A-N-D, uh, H-Y-P-H-A-E. On Instagram, it's Oakland.H-Y-P-H-A-E. You got to put the dot in there. It's a fake, it's a fake uh, account that's just Oakland Hyphae straight through. Report that one and follow Oakland.Hyphae on IG. Uh, on the internet, it's www.oaklandshyphae510.com. Uh, again, oaklandhyphae510.com on the internet. And what I really suggest people do uh, to to really keep up with us is 
pay attention to our uh, you can sign up for our newsletter on the website but also um sign up for our sub stack it we you know right now instagram is really heavy on the censorship they'll just take you know your your account for for nothing these days and i want to make sure that my relationship stays uh as direct to the people as possible and Substack is a really good medium for me to be able to communicate with y'all and show you pictures and behind the scenes and videos and stuff like that agreed cool and when's your conference conference is september 17th and 18th so next oh this coming saturday and sunday it's coming Saturday and Sunday oh around the corner. <laughs> well, I can't wait to hear all about it and uh, wish you the best of luck. Um, Reggie, anything else you want to say? Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. I can't wait to see you in person sometime soon, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Hope it's sooner and later, man. I'd love to get to the Bay again soon. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining us, Reggie, and I hope we get to do it again. Absolutely. I'm, I hope that I get a chance to interview you on my platform next. Whenever. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> All right. Thanks again.